So at the beginning of each class, I'm going to want to do a brief, debrief from last week's class. And um, we had a really cool class last week. And I wanted to get your takeaway as to what were your thoughts when you left that class? And also, how did you navigate through the city through the weekend? And then what did you think about that changed the way you you move around the city um, as a result of that class? So it's just a couple of popcorn, but I feel like a transition from last week to this week is good. We talked about transportation equity. I mean, let me debrief you. Planning and engineering design for equitable systems. How did you navigate through the city differently after last week's class? Is that a tough question? <laughs> yes. Um, my, my PDF here is running slow. I was trying to find the exact quote because it was kind of like in line with what was presented last week. But the thing that really hit me hard was this idea that to truly promote equity, we need to spend more money and create more infrastructure in lower income and minority areas than in predominantly white or higher income areas to achieve like fairness in terms of safety and access and all that. Um, and, I, and I did write this in my email, so you already saw this probably. No, I know, but let's go ahead. Uh, um, but like, I, no offense to everyone here, I, I kind of almost feel like we're, we're not the people that that need as much of what potentially benefit from in this last project of these great ideas to promote safety, to promote equity. Like, I wish I knew about the needs of East Portland. I feel like that's probably one of the areas. Maybe there are some people who live in East Portland. I don't. I live in an area that really is already really well set up. Um, so I, I left class feeling a little guilty um, and talked with coworkers about this. They're probably sick of hearing this right now, but I don't care. Um, and was just trying to get some of their thoughts. Uh, one of my coworkers lives down in um, Brentwood, Darlington, I think it's called. So she's a little more familiar with some of the different challenges throughout the city. But um, a lot of this has been very eye opening for me. It's maybe the parking area, though, to feel guilty because you're a white individual who yeah. wants a rich employment. So, how do you take that guilt and kind of turn it around? I know it's kind of psychological question, but um, we don't have to dig deep into that. I just feel like that's a really that's a really powerful emotion, especially um, as you navigate through the city. Like, I feel guilty because Yeah, and, and what I mean by that is, um, so in, in part, I have a, a very strong religious background. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. And when I'm taking the best of that, you know, I want to focus on loving people and fairness. Uh, and I feel like some of the ways that I've understood the world or my worldview has been colored has not led me to the correct application of that. Um, so I've, I've tried to do things in my life to help, and now I'm sometimes questioning, you know, who were those, uh, who was I helping, and were they the people that really needed help? Um, so I maybe use the, the term guilt loosely, like it, it's, this idea has been hitting me powerfully. It's not like I'm, I care. Let's That's phrase it that way. I care and I'm not sure what to do, and I also feel like I'm benefiting from the system more than I should. Meaning that's what you really need to do this class and this class to be an advocate for other people and not just um, your own space. So, thank you. Good talk, Paul. Good talk. Anyone else? Yes. I sort of feel like, especially because I do, you know, commute my bike a lot, I try to be very, or have to be very aware of sort of the transportation environment around me to begin with. But having that, that last class made me partly think about my priorities yeah. like that some of the things that i see as big frustrations like there are probably objectively you know places that need to be more work than like intersections that i think are frustrating that are just not where not where i live and work mm -hmm. so it did it did you know push me a little bit to think like outside of the areas that i've spent time on where else mm -hmm. needs help mm -hmm. but i do think as far as what you're saying about white guys, among other things. Um, I think about that sometimes in terms of, like, unfortunately, in terms of, like, what I can get away with. And that means everything from, like, with the privilege everything from yeah. dealing with police, but also just with other people, you know? Like, if, if a driver
driver says, like, what are you doing in the roadway here? And like, I, I will just stop in the middle of the road, leave my bike in front of his car, go talk to him about why I'm where I am, why the, you know, this is the appropriate place to be. And like, I can do that and not worry that much about it because like, what's, what's going to happen? So like, I'm in a position where as a, you know, as a tall white guy who, you know, so do you like that would be a lot harder for. Yeah. So do you think that teaches you empathy then? I think that, I mean, I think more so, no, not directly, but I think it's good to always be reminded more of the experience of people who, who aren't in my position, you know, and, I, and yeah, I think that was what last class was really good at at 10 was, is what, um, I see all the problems that I face, but here are all the problems that I don't even have to worry about. Your problems are actually a big deal because they're, they're your problems, right? I remember Allie McNeil way, way back then talking about how her problems were such a big deal in her scope, in her mind, but then everybody else's, they have their own issues. So I think, I think maybe what you're getting at is a sense of empathy to some degree when you just put yourself, uh, not in somebody else's shoes, but to um, navigate through experiences in that way. And that's publicly sensitive to others. I grew up here as an Invisalign in the 80s on Broadway. And um, navigating through the city wasn't that hard. I learned English really quickly. We took the bus everywhere we went. And then later on as an adult, I met some friends who came here after World War II and they were Hungarian. And so they were more white, but then they drew this interesting distance between Wait, it must have been really hard for you to grow up here because your color is different from everybody else. But them, they said that they were able to get assimilated easier because they look like everybody else. They look like the, the Caucasian folk. So if she said that as a kid, I probably don't know what to say, but her sharing that later as an adult um, just really resonates as to how, we, how we're perceived differently in the world and how the world perceives us differently. <laughs> Any more before we move on? Yes, sir. You have a public announcement. Thirty seconds. Well, since we're talking about equity, um, I brought these um, orange blurbs. Um, it's somewhat serendipitous that this class is usefully <laughs> and helpfully focusing on equity. Um, these are on Wednesday nights at PSU starting next Halloween Eve. Um, I assume most people probably are fine with doing Thursday night, and not other nights, but. If you have a laundromat or a Fred Meyer store or a telephone pole in your neighborhood, this uh, group is partially selected apparently by geography. It'd be really helpful to let people know about these. And within 30 seconds, um, the next, the first topic is um, equity. Do people know just by quick show of hands about the dispute with neighborhood associations and the code? Um, so we're gonna have, okay, good. Um, a bunch of uh, people who are against changing the code for equity and dignity coming. In. So it'd be useful to have people at least listen we're going to be a polite facilitation thing to hear why they do or don't think white privilege even exists, et cetera. Um, so that's the first one. Um, there's also uh, a list of the topics on the yellow sheet. Um, there's a candidates forum. We have 10 candidates for city, county, statewide office are coming, including one of the candidates for secretary of state. That's also on a Wednesday night. Um, the last one I put in here is Ted Wheeler is going to come. That's why I've been asking you a lot about speakers. Ted Wheeler is going to talk um, November 13th, the Wednesday night. So again, this may contradict with people's schedules. Mostly Portland State people tend to, to come in and go. But if you know of people that might be interested in any of the topics, or again, if you have a laundromat or a bulletin board at Fred Meyer, put them up. Coffee shop, you want to leave them, that would be great. I have extra copies because I missed a few people who came in after. That was probably two minutes that I owe you. <laughs> Thank you. 90 seconds. <laughs> Anyone else regarding last week's class? Yes. So last week we talked a little bit about lighting things. Yeah. Um, a bit. And I, in the blog post that she wrote, there was a little bit more about lighting. Uh -huh. um, and I have, I'm a, the bike ambassador at work, and I was asked to give a presentation this week, but I couldn't do it. So I, I passed it on to somebody else and I suggested talking about that. 
And it was interesting to me how, like, third rail it seemed like that this person who was giving the presentation instead of me was just like, I absolutely do not want to talk about that. Thank you for telling me, but I am not going to bring it up in a work context. So they didn't want to talk about lighting in terms of like how to impact other people uh, like different skin tones are lighted differently and the lighting mm. needs to work for all skin tones because we were the a topic of the talk was how drivers can be more aware of cyclists especially in the winter when cyclists might deviate from what drivers usually expect like cyclists may not always be in the bike lane in the winter because there are piles of leaves and like a lot of water going down the bike lane so they might go out into the street and I was it was about different things that are like specific to winter and one of the things I was going to bring up is people are commuting at night mm -hmm. because night is longer mm -hmm. and be aware that lighting affects people differently and he was absolutely not going to talk about that in the meeting. Oh, wow. I think, Hard. yeah, because I, I think he felt uncomfortable yeah. bringing it up at work. We're, you know, obviously this is Portland, our office, because it's a federal, um, in, you know, it's about a federal government, we tend to be slightly more diverse than the uh, typical. Um, you know, industry in Portland, but still it's mostly white people. <laughs> and I think that he wasn't comfortable bringing up something that could have been perceived as being related to race at work. That's very true. Unfortunately, very true. So I thought that was really interesting because I found the topic really interesting and I think he was interested by it too, uh, but he was not. <laughs> yeah, I, I think sometimes we, this, I've said this several times in my other classes, when you wake up in the morning, there are two ways to function, either out of fear or out of love. Right? Those two. And if you function out of fear, then you're going to be scared. And you're not going to tap into other things that you're not comfortable with. But if you function out of love, then you're able to recognize and empathize and relate with others. So I think we have a lot of learning to do. Um, so I'm going to move forward to this deep session. We've got three of our guest speakers here to talk about planning and policy from a regional level and then also to a local level. And um, these are my colleagues that I've known for many, many years. Two of them have spoken to this class before. One of them is an alumni. And we have a newbie in this uh, <laughs> who's not new to the industry at all. So. First of all, I want to introduce um, Margie Broadway with TriMet. She's a deputy. Metro. A Metro. Oh, uh, it's TriMet. TriMet. Yeah. Mine's not being on it. No, you. <laughs> with Metro. Um, I'm going to do the quick introduction first. So we had Margie um, in planning and development, deputy director at Metro. Um, and then um, Bob Hastings, who's an agency architect in transit oriented design with TriMet. And then also Art here with policy planning and um, district manager at the spot. So you know, the presentation, I'm going to hand that floor over to Marky. Thanks. It's really hot in here. I usually wear a blazer, hot. but I am like dying right now. I don't know why. Um, I know. It's um, always hot in the new building. It's very hot. So yeah, bear with me. I'm like sweating. I feel like I'm sweating. So yeah, I got it. I got it. All right. Um, yeah, my, my name is Margie Broadway. I'm the deputy director of the plan department at Metro. I've been there two years. Prior to that, I had the pleasure of working with Art at the City for approximately four years. Prior to that, I worked at ODOT for six years. And prior to that, I was a corporate attorney. So I've been around for a long time. I'm old, <laughs> as I tell you. But um, so I kind of, I tend to, the regional government is a good place for me to be at because I do tend to bring a perspective of the local government, ODOT, and kind of private sector together. Um, really enjoyed your just your, your short conversation here on race and, I, and equity, and I'm um, going to get to that later in my presentation, but 
I'm going to also, in the beginning of my presentation, talk a little bit about history of the connection between land use and transportation. But one thing to think about when I'm going through the history is not only how you move through the transportation, but who created the transportation system that we have here today. Uh, all right, where's my clicker? I just went right in. I'm at point. Oh, all right. Go. Um, all right. So th this is Metro. Does everybody familiar with Metro? I'm not sure. Um, okay, so Metro is one of, or it's the only independently elected regional government that has both transportation and land use authority. The only one in the United States of America. Most metropolitan organizations, MPOs, it's a transportation term, are um, not independently elected, and then they don't have that convergence of land use and transportation authority, which makes us really special. So how did that happen? Why, why is Metro so special? What's the next slide? I have a lot of slides. I'm going to be going to you a lot. So here's Metro. And just when I say the Metro region, um, we serve one, approximately 1.5 million people. We provide uh, services and coordination with three counties, 24 cities, TriMet, ODOT, and the Port of Portland, working everywhere from Wilsonville to Sandy, um, down to one of my favorites down to Wilsonville. Um, that's the Portland region. Next slide. So back in the 70s, here's a little history. Um, the, the state land use laws, as we know, were created in the 1970s. And it was Governor McCall. If you haven't heard about Senate Bill 100, look it up. Um, but that's the foundation of our planning in Oregon. Um, so that's really what if people are familiar with the Land Conservation Development Agency, LCDC, oversees this function. But he basically has to say, said at the time, we can't be um, proud of our parks, proud of our environment, unless we deal with suburban sprawl. And we, this has to be part of our ethos. And this was really the basis of our land use laws. So next slide. Uh, around the same time, Metro was created, and this idea of an urban growth boundary was created. And the urban growth boundary is the line you see here, and basically what it says is that Metro, will kind of, Metro working very closely, right, right, our, with our um, local agencies, must plan and densify within the urban growth boundary, protecting parks and forests. And, and there must be identified green spaces within that urban growth boundary. We are required to update that urban growth boundary. We report to the state. It has to be updated every five years. We take kind of a build, what's called like a, try not to use too many terms, but like a buildable land survey. And we also assess the available availability of green space. Um, I forgot to mention Metro also oversees a regional park system. So that's really key because we can purchase land for things like affordable housing, but we also have the authority and the funds to purchase green spaces in addition to our planning. So next slide, I'm jumping ahead. So why does this matter? <laughs> um, now this, this is one of the largest POD projects in history, at least it was when it was created. This was Ornico, Ornico Station in Hillsboro. Eight, at the time, 1,800 homes concentrated here, basically created a new community in concert with the West Line and Bob, you probably know more history on this than I do. Um, but this is what we're talking about. This was created as a transit oriented development community. I think Bob, you'll talk a little bit more about POD. Shorthand is called POD. Um, but it, this is this was identified as a center in our growth plan. We're going to talk about it. But this is, you know, it's a little bit of a jab, but this is what's following. This is a snapshot of our growth boundary. So this is within the urban growth boundary and this is without. Look at the amount of farmland and green spaces protected and look at the density just on that strip. And our urban growth, um, our 2040 growth concept I'll talk about really has its centers and corridors approach. So forest road is a center and you travel the corridor and you get another center. So next slide. Um, and again, this is another snapshot. Obviously you can tell what's in the urban growth boundary and what's out. This is at the edge of our boundary. Um, so here's our 2040 growth concept. It was foundational in terms of thinking through how the transportation and land use fit together. You can see the circles are centers and coming through in corridors. Um, if you follow anything that Metro does, we still are following this idea of centers and corridors, identifying the centers, creating travel on the corridors, as well as key services, lifeline routes, things like that. Um, so next slide. Wow, 
I didn't know that one. I didn't know if it keep clicking. Oh, I didn't. I, did I do that? I don't know. I think I'll uh, for your next meeting. So why why am I talking so much about land use and land use planning in a transportation uh, class? Uh, there's a saying I think Gordon Price first has said it that the best transportation plan is a land is a land use plan, and that's because we know that you have not only multimodal trips, biking, walking, transit trips that are better if they're short distances and concentrated, but frankly, your vehicle trips become less. And so really being thoughtful about this is, you know, an area, Art might recognize this, worked on the tram. Good land use planning, not so good land use planning. Next slide. Um, and, you know, we have some data. This is a little outdated. I actually went to our modeling team and said, can you update this for my slides? And they said, not today, because we have a million other projects we're doing for you, Margie. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a little outdated, but these, you know, Metro, as a primary planning agency, takes pride that we have something to do with the fact that we have a very low, regionally, driving alone trip rate. If you look at Portland, you know, we're right there with Boston and Washington, D.C., big cities, much bigger than us, right? So here's Portland. New York, San Francisco, Boston, Boston, and here we are in Portland, punching way above our weight. That is also true by commuting by transit, right? We have higher transit ridership than LA, you know, and again, punching above our weight of transit ridership. That's in part because we've got good land use plans and centers and corridors concepts to allow these trips to happen. Um, this is more bike to walk work. Again, we've punched way above our weight. I think this is really interesting. This is the most growing area in, in working from home. <laughs> like it, it's the most, it, there's the growth, it's a mode shift, it's the most growth. Portland has a lot of people working at home, not as much as San Diego. But again, I think it's, a, it's that flexibility that allows people to make the choices that they need to make, whether they're traveling or working at home. Next slide. Um, and it really, all travel patterns are really regional. Um, I find Clackamas County fascinating. 67% of Clackamas County leave to go to work every day. These are work commute trips. Washington County, almost half leave their county to go to work every day. Clark County, 50% leave every day, um, which means that not a lot of people are working where they live or living where they work. And the interesting thing about this trend is these numbers haven't changed much over the time, but the types of jobs and who is commuting has changed. So while the old suburban model was to build your house in the suburb and go to downtown Portland for your fancy office job, um, what is now happening is more office jobs are moving out here than Nike, C, Intel, the Tektronix, but low-income people are getting pushed out, and the service jobs are now the hotel industry, the, um, the, the other kind of service industries are more concentrated in the downtown. The commute patterns are the same, but who's impacted by these long commute patterns are, is starting to um, I'm gonna. This is just to show it's a regional connected system that's all planned. I'm gonna skip this slide. I'm gonna keep going. And then at Metro, what we really work on is we work on we have modal plans that span the entire region. This is a snapshot of our active transportation plan. It looks really complicated with a lot of lines. It is, um, but you know what we want to show here is that both off street and on street, we see the bike side connections around the region connected as one. And if you're traveling, especially in a trail, you're not thinking whose jurisdiction am I in right now? You're just thinking you're headed to a park, you're headed along a water corridor, or on Night Drive, going into different places. Next to this, we got a trails network, kind of covered in that one. Next slide. A freight network, our freight system is incredibly important. And it's interesting, um, you know, we serve the Port of Portland as well as Port of Vancouver is a major port across the bridge. Um, every time you click on Amazon, that's regional flex, you know, if you're an Amazon Prime member, you're, you're on this freight route. If you ride a bike, if you have SRAM, Shimano, what's the other TNT? Nobody uses TNT anymore. <laughs> your bike parts come in in this port and get to your bike shop on these regional freight routes. Um, it's and it's all connected. If there's a, something that breaks down in this regional freight system, then those packages, those bike parts don't get to the bike shop. And then we have a regional transit network. And this is the updated network as far as our 2018 RTT. Um, we do have way more, this used to be more concentrated on our future max rail system. What we're really focusing on is how to include frequent service buses into this, as well as I think you're gonna hear a lot about what we call enhanced transit. 
faster, more reliable buses and I think art and modern implement is a must keep going. And then we have a new focus on safety. Um, when I worked at City of Portland, this is something I'm very passionate about that I helped bring to Metro. Uh, used to be the safety division manager. We've done a regional study for a concentration of uh, fatal and fearful buses based on high injury corridors or serious injuries. This is an overlap over an equity map. So the dark color and the gray represent race, low income in English as a second language. So it's pretty incredible to look at this map, especially as you get out here and you start to see these lines right here go through the heart of these equity communities. This is all of East Portland, this is Metro East Portland. There is a high degree of overlap between where crashes are happening and low income and people of color living. Next slide. Um, we also have new equity policies for the first time ever. Uh, I think we were the first MPO in the nation to try to remodel equity as part of our regional transportation plan. And what we did was we looked at where people of color are living, where they're likely to move, where they're working, and we modeled access to jobs. And what we found is that, um, that if we implement our regional transportation plan, safety improves, public health improves, Access jobs somewhat improves, but affordability continues to get worse. And I'm going to talk about how where housing fits in this as part of the housing picture and part of the community. Um, and then we also are wrestling with, I think, well, everybody in transportation right now, emerging technologies. How do they fit into these plans? This is everything from Lyft to Uber to scooters to bike share. How do we work with the private sector to foster and really Embrace the innovation, but steer it in a way that meets our equity goals, our climate goals, our safety goals. Next slide. So what is the regional transportation plan? The regional transportation plan is a plan that we do every five years. It was last updated last year in 2018. It's a huge amount of policy plans and it's a lot of work <laughs> and projects. And it's really important because we have regional tables the Joint Policy Advisory Committee, which is elected in a technical advisory committee that identifies those policies and projects. And how am I being on time? I talked really fast. You're good. Okay. Okay. So um, the important part about this is actually the regional transportation plan, once adopted, those projects, those policies, those plans, is a federal document. So federal highways has to approve it, federal transit administration has to approve it, and in Oregon, it's also a state document. And the land use is considered a land use action for DLTD. So when we get agreement, all those suburbs and all those cities that agree to the RTC, this is kind of an overlay document planning for all those 26 jurisdictions. And they're a planning document, ideally, flow from that, flow from that. And uh, if anybody's talked about transportation system plans, so we want consistency between the way you want transportation plan and our transportation systems in our local jurisdiction to work. Okay, next slide. Um, so in our last RTC, we have a constrained list and an unconstrained. The constrained list is the amount of money we reasonably think we can raise or receive from the federal government. Um, we identified $42 million of projects. This is actually a website. It's an interactive map. I, you know, get a beer, glass of wine, spend the night, click on all these dots. You can see all the projects planned throughout the region. I think it's super fun, but I'm not wrong. No, you don't. Yeah, built up. I'm sorry, 42 billion. I'm sorry, thank you, billion. I've been in a lot of conversations today about transportation region ledger. I don't know if you've read the reporters, but I've been talking about millions and billions all day today. Um, thank you, billion. Thank you, Gore. I'm going to talk about that. Um, and we have, so this gives you a flavor of the projects. We have a couple with a B in the three billion area in our regional transportation plan, some in the medium range. So these tend to be the big ones. Uh, this is called like major projects, mega projects. These are bridges and roadways, bridges and roadways. You can see as we get to the lower dollar amount of projects, 25 million, 10 million. You see the pink is biking and walking, and the transit is the blue, and they start to kind of increase. You see a lot more transit in here, more transit in that 100 million bucket. Next slide. So, this is another way to break it down. I like this slide. It's a mix of in our regional RTC transit capital 5.1 billion, transit operations 13.7 billion. And again, this is not what's funded, this is what we need. This is what the region has identified the need. And then highway, road, and bridge operations. Next slide. Um, 
but it's still not going to be enough. So one another way to look at our plans is to say, well, what would it take to complete our active transportation system? Given the amount of 42 billion sounds like so much money, right? Because it'd be, but it's still not enough. We would have to, with that money that we're assuming, we would take us, it would take us to 200, or I'm sorry, 2,252 or 2,253 either side. I'm sure my ESA thinking measures out to complete, yeah, yeah. to complete our active transportation system at the rate that we're proposing to fund it. Same with roadways and highways, same with transit. Um, so the need just completely outsizes what we think we can at raise funds for. Um, Oregon has a hard time raising funds. We don't have a sales tax. This is a comparison of Oregon to other states. I love this slide um, because not, you know, Art knows I spend a lot of my time sort of see banging our head against the wall going, why can't we get money for this? Um, so this is California, Washington. Our neighbors on both sides have a lot more authority of vehicle sales and then they have a lot more state. Uh, and when it says vehicle sales, that's, that's the state that is sales tax for that. And we don't have the ability to use that. We just have our state gas tax and registration fees. Next slide. So we're trying to do something about it. You may have read in the newspaper today, it was, a lot, it was a big press day for Metro, that we're working really hard to do a transportation measure to raise funds in 2013. We have a task force, it's a 35 member task force, one third business, one third nonprofit, one third elected. And they identified as a great hardworking group of people, they identified the top 11 corridors. And the good news is there was a high amount of overlap between the, their high priority corridors and the corridors that were identified as high need in our RTC. They include our busiest transit line on 82nd. 82nd Avenue here also tends to have the highest crash rates in the region. Second highest number of crash rates is CB Highway over here. Also a, a very big equity community in Aloha and Beaverton and also a major transit line. We are quite pleased because the task force really they saw the same needs as our plan and it's a nice overlap. So we're really seeing the measure as a way to implement our plan. And I'm gonna pass out when I'm done more information about our transportation measure because I could probably talk about it all night, but I'm not going to. But if you want more, uh, it's called, well, I got our comms team is training me. Let's keep moving. God, get moving 2020, I'm terrible. Yeah. Get moving 2020. I do not work in comms. I'm like, do the hashtag. I'm like, I'll try. Um, <laughs> um, but I have more information, there's a big forum tonight. Um, okay, so next slide. So I'm gonna bring this back up to a little bit more systems thinking. Also at Metro, I talked about land use, I talked about transportation, those things obviously you can't talk about those two without talking about housing and housing strategies. Our Metro Council did something very bold last year and they put on the ballot, the second largest ballot in the state, bringing to the voters, our second largest bond in the state, $652.8 million measure to implement affordable housing in the region. It passed by a landslide, even in Clackamas County. It passed in every county and every city. People want affordable housing. They understand it's a problem. We are on track to create 3,900 permanently affordable homes. In addition, we are targeting it at families because that's the feedback that we've heard, that you need to have more spaces, not just cute little um, single apartments, but really serving families. The power of this is having Metro <clears throat> administer it. The housing team, they sit right next to my office, are sitting right next to our transit oriented development team, are sitting right next to our transportation team. And we really feel like Metro is in a really good position to combine land use, housing, and transportation. So next, next slide, I think I alluded to this. So how do we take the systems approach? One of the things we're grappling with is a, is a that is a massive amount of growth. We continue to grow 35, the 33, I gotta get this on, 33,500 new residents move to Portland every year. That's like two Greshams. Um, wait, what's the number? Sorry, I just got from my modeling team what we're expected to grow. So this number changes like all the time. I have to run downstairs for a modeling team and say, what's our projected growth today? And it only goes up. Yeah, we're expected one, Oh, geez, hold on, I lost the number. I'll come back to it. Um, but I think it's around 150,000 people in the next couple of years. So we're really struggling with where to put people, right? So we have a great growth plan, um, but maybe we're surpassing any, you know, I, I think we're surpassing in terms of growth anything that anybody could have planned for in the 70s. 
Next slide. And certainly even 20 years ago when we did the 2040 refresh. Some of our strategies are working. We know from census data that people who move here, so half of the new commuters are using non-driving modes. So that's good for growth, right? That helps with traffic. We need to make sure when people move here, they continue to pick other modes. Next slide. But we also know that in addition to finding new housing, the rent is going up. So not only do we need to help buy new housing, but we also have a policy person who's working on rental strategies. Rents have risen far faster than renter's income. This is the average rent, and this is the median renter income. So in this growth, we're struggling both with the traffic and transportation and the growth of um, rents and unaffordability of homes. Next slide. And then who bears the brunt of this? People of color, right? This is, um, I think Tamika Butler's coming, isn't yeah, she? She's so Tamika, yeah, and she's become a friend of mine. She came to Metro, and this is actually, I had her do a, a workshop with my staff. And this is something she said to the staff. I asked her if I could quote it, because um, I just love this quote so much. Um, she said, we have to recognize that when white people come to our spaces with their past year, okay, it's so good, I read it. And the record players and all their bikes tell us suddenly we I don't know why I get so jealous. They've been created in our own community is different because the reality is it's perfectly segregated to the other side of town. But now that you can't afford your side of town, you want to be on our side of town and learn to compete. So this is Williams. So I'm so proud. But I think you get goosebumps. <laughs> I really just, you know, um, I think this is truly some of the unintended consequences of some of the planning that we've done as planners. And this goes back to who planned this system. So I think there's good intent, right? There's good intent to help the environment. There's a good intent to do bike and walk modes. There's good intent to create density. But what we're really missing with that planning is for who? Who are we gentrifying for? Who are we creating biking and walking trips for? And that's that, this is why I want to talk about what where we go from here and who needs to be planning our future from here. Okay, next slide. Um, and let's face it, the, the urban planning has been racist. The history of our urban planning has been racist. You should, if you don't know now, um, if you shouldn't, this is the picture of where I-5 was put in. Um, or wait, no, this is Minnesota freeway going in, but I believe this is- That's I-5. Yeah, thank you. Okay, this really threw me out. Oh, there's Minnesota freeway construction. They called it the Pants Man, too. No. The street, yeah, the street, the street, street dog. Thank you. I was like, I swear I told my friends in a picture of I-5. Yeah. Minnesota, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And it, you know, that I could talk a lot about this tonight, um, but really we know that there was not even unintentional, but an intentional strategic plan to put I-5 where all the people of color lived in Portland in the Albina place, and they were displaced. And that's a story that has been told over and over again in the history of transportation. Highways, major investments were put in places of where low-income communities were, and they were displaced over and over again. Let's keep going. And we also know that there's this interplay between safety and equity. And one way to think about it, because I get asked, well, Margie, why are so many people of color dying? What is that about? When you think about it, that's where people can afford to live. So there's also a high amount of overlap of low-income housing and low-income services. If you guys ever look at like where you can go to um, a health service and get free services, they're all located on these high crash corridors. So this stuff is all related. Next one. Okay, so what are we gonna do about it? Well, this is where we can turn our corner and say, Metro is working very hard. Um, we came up with an equity plan last year and we're looking at doing a refresh of our 2040 to make sure that we have this lens, this community driven people first lens. So the first thing that we're doing as part of our equity strategy is calling it community stability. It's a people first approach to keeping people in place. Um, it's really, a, you know, another way to say it is the anti gentrification, but we like community stabilization, doing much more focused equity and outreach engagement. And then we have many, many growth pro grant programs whether they're land use grant programs or transportation grant programs, and we're prioritizing equities across all of our grant programs. I'm happy to say we just did a scan and every single one of our grant programs has equity as a criteria as I can say. Okay, so this is happening, next slide. We're also gonna update our 2040 growth plan. We, we had a, a workshop internally and externally. We talked about these issues and said, well, what was missing? We now, we're, we're not in our 70s. What do we need to do? Um, so next slide. First and foremost, we need to look at all of our land use decisions and we need to update the 2040 growth plan and centers with a racial equity lens. 
where people of color living, where are their centers, where are their travel patterns. We also need to take climate change mitigation and adaptation into account and really make sure that we're thinking about community resilience in that spot. So these are kind of the overlays. And when I say this, we're doing a deep dive into data trends of these two and then having seen, which means what's the new economy? We're not just looking at it, where's the industrial areas, but what, where are people living that have good wage jobs or potential for blue collar jobs, which are very important to low income people that have access to that. Again, great places, community resilience. Next slide. And then this is our timeline for updating our 2040 growth plan. We'll be done by summer of 23. There'll be lots of opportunities for engagement. I'm really proud that we're taking kind of what I say is a, a proud history from the 1970s and trying to update it with a new lens. And that's all I have for today. Awesome. All right. Thank you. On our transportation measure there's a form tonight you can go online to learn more uh, i'm very very excited about all the safety and transit projects we're funding folks are fun folks are fun <laughs> yeah. you guys have any quick questions for marky at this point before we go um yeah. quickly yes mm -hmm. uh, the sunrise movement and extinction rebellion yeah are both expressed opposition to the uh metro bond measure next year is it correct that 50 percent of the money would go for asphalt and highways and fossil fuels oh i'm so glad you asked me absolutely not correct less than 10 percent uh, uh there's a great breakdown it's on our website we released our project draft recommendations and the breakdown is that uh almost 50 percent of packages safety improvements by ted about 40 percent of it is transit investments a lot of enhanced transit transit lines and less than 10 percent of roadway improvements um, and those roadway improvements are all in near our urban growth edge where there's less roadways like you saw from the county go ahead uh, i was just curious if you could share any um, thoughts on why um, work from home is the largest yeah growth. well you know i want to i want to hire a work from home modal coordinator um mm -hmm. that tells everybody the benefits of working with the gauntlets and the key materials and I work from home, and that's definitely yeah, right, right, right. Maybe that's your next job, right? Because it's such a benefit to the system. People talk about work. Um, no, I don't. You know, I don't know. I think it's a combination of work culture, frankly, is changing, and I think it's a combination of getting traffic. It's getting worse. Um, and it, you know, we. I don't try to deny that traffic is going to get worse, and I don't try to deny it's going to get any better. We're growing up to be a big city, and I think if we look at those other places where they work, they have really bad traffic problems. So people are doing the math, both employees and employers saying, oh, I could have this really valuable employee sit in traffic for two hours. Or I could have this really valuable employee doing work at home. Uh, so that's what I think, but that's just like my opinion. Is it something that like Metro or CBOT or TriMet, I mean, is that, has there been any coordinated push to try to promote that or is it just no, organically happened? No, I mean, we have a program that's called the RTO Regional Transportation Options that talks about the options of people going around. But, you know, it's funny, I said it as a joke, like encouraging people to stay and work at home. It's really not thought of in our, the transportation community as something that we should be pushing, but we should be. So we should be, yeah, thanks. Question. Uh, there was an article recently that came out of the Washington Post about the highway in Syracuse that's getting torn down mm -hmm. and potentially how reparations for the community there might come into play as well. Is Metro thinking about tearing down any highways? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wish, you know, so Met Metro doesn't build or um, we don't own or operate. Or bridges. Anything. Yeah, but we 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 want you know we um what we do so that our our whole power and lots of power in these conversations is that federal funds flow through us and then we have our RTP policy. So we actually have a policy that you're not supposed to build a new roadway without doing <coughs> transit demand management, RTO, ITS, that's like managing the system first. But right now, there's no talk about tearing it down. There is a very active and needed conversation about the the what needs to be done for buying on vision that community that will be um, displaced during I five. And I think they would call, but I don't want to put um, words in the mouths of the people who are advocating people of color. But I think there the idea of reparations is there. Like you 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 need to continue to invest in this area. You need to reinvest in this area and bring it back. 
And the measure is we have 65 million set aside to do that and to serve our two positions for our five years. I want to thank our peer city of the Metro, the city of Metro and um, and Metro and the city and others have been working with and aligning with vision to kind of apply that and help realize those goals. And we also have a section of the I-5 road quarter project in the first year 11 oh, that just got updated to the syllabus. So um, we're going to have representatives from um, ODOT come talk about the I-5 project. And um, I was trying to bring somebody in from the line of vision, but um, she actually wanted to take this class. <laughs> Rakaya. Really? Caitlin, come to us. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that was actually good. Okay. Um, Bob, you're up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margie. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, uh, obviously, delighted to be here uh, for the class. Um, I'm pinch-hitting for a guy named Alan Laco, who is more on our kind of policy side of things. I'm an architect and for 19 years was really involved with helping to deliver um, on the uh, planning and premise of Metro. Um, so I'm getting a little bit over my skis and if I overlap with Margie's points, we just kind of move along. Yeah. You're the only architect in the room. You gotta defend the, the, the professor. I gotta defend nothing. My defense is like, I just don't want to fall and you know. Oh no. Another note. I'm also a very good juggler. I'm juggling three professions at once. I should have brought some balls. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Um, so, kind of picking up uh, what Margie was telling you about, you know, where does all this stuff kind of come from? And this is a great quote. This is even back earlier before Thomas Hall. And this is Lewis Mumford, who there were sort of two schools of thought were coming into Portland back in the 30s. One was uh, Moses, who was going to part the seas and, and prescribe all the freeways that ended up getting built. Um, but there's a countervailing uh, question being asked that by other folks saying, hey, wait, wait a minute, is this really the future we want? So when Lewis Mumford came out and he looked at you know, the Portland region, it was like, wow, this place is gorgeous. But he was hearing what was being talked about and he had this very prophetic uh, comment to the Portland City Club. And basically saying, do you have the smarts? Do you have the ability to do this? Can you invent the systems that are going to be necessary to survive in this place? And the answer proved no, a big resounding no. Uh, this is uh, not the air quality we had a couple summers ago, but uh, back in the 60s. Um, I grew up in a state south of here in a metropolitan area that had lots of cars. Um, so my uh, tale of woe is um, growing up in smog and fleeing that state and coming to Oregon and choosing to be here because um, I saw that this was the best place to try and wage that battle to um, push back against the segregation that we've been for the natural system which that's why Metro and TriMet began to have happen. That's what we were actually formed, was to help prepare the natural systems that become so destroyed. Um, we asked about removing freeways and um, just uh, the next slide, please. Why it's nice to move out. Um, when the Mount Hood Freeway was stopped, not by um, leadership at the state and local and uh, city level, but by this groundswell of folks getting involved very much in the neighborhood and saying, we saw what happened in uh, North Portland. We saw what's happening with the I-405 project. We see that you're going to push another freeway through um, Southeast Portland, and that's what's got to stop. So that's where the revolution began to turn back, and we began to try to sort of um, wage a different kind of an idea. And I, my thesis is that we began to understand that the extraction from nature in order to fuel our um, society we were beginning to see really what the outcomes of that and the impact on us. And so I think overall, there is a sort of overarching idea that no, we do have Eden, that we've been sort of given this place or taken it. And what are we gonna do about it? What, what, how are we gonna respond to Lewis uh, Mumford's uh, call? And part of it is that we are trying to invent the institutions that can serve that need. So Metro didn't just sort of get sent to us by somebody else, it was invented here. TriMet was a uh, foundering bus company that was a, a private company that was just bartering into the earth and it was grabbed back and said, no, we are going to 
a public, make a public transit system, and we're going to put these two institutions together um, to think about the whole region next. Um, and, and Art and I have been sort of living this work for together for many, many years, but we've seen it happen firsthand in Europe. I think this class is a great opportunity to say that. When we work together, there is this multiplier effect that happens. There's this leverage that comes out of that thing. So one plus one equals three, meaning we put together both the, 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 the problems that we're facing and the opportunities that we see, and we begin to invent what might become the solutions to those problems. And what had and my what I've seen has happened is that as people engage in that process, and then we go to this very difficult, you know, uh, trying to solve and understand what we're doing, that awareness, really that kind of community <clears throat> IQ is going both ways, both on the sort of bureaucratic side but also on the solution side. And what comes out of that are greater, I think uh, I've seen this uh, outcomes, greater ideas, greater ways to approach you know, what we think are intractable problems. Um, so I'm a big believer in, in the sort of small group democracy um, in our region as a way to uh, approach this. Next. What we're finding is that, and, and Marty had this sort of great kind of context of things, you know, you know, we're the 25th largest state, we're the 25th largest city, and yet I like to say it's punching above our weight class. And how, why do we do that and how do we do that? Part of it is that this recognition of limits recognition that you can't do it by yourself and I can't do it by myself but when we come together we begin to see that we can be start to make uh, new opportunities and we start to see that what we might think are very different agendas when we sort of start to overlap them we become hmm you know it's actually something here that we can work on together I still need what I need and you, you, you need your outcomes but that uh, coming together in the Pioneer Courthouse Square is one of those great examples of, of a place that was you know it, it came about that recognition next um, again as a designer the architect in the room um, I've come to understand and change that my attitude about design is something that I will create it'll be beautiful you will love it you'll buy it to <laughs> design is something that we can do together and design is something that when we have people who really are trying to understand how to navigate in a community from their lens from their perspective um, getting that process to actually play out in the laboratory, which is our region, creates again these better outcomes. And I really enjoy, this is a picture we drew in the mall, where um, a person with limited sight and a person with limited mobility, we're helping us try to figure out how are we gonna put the street furnitures and the shelters and the windscreens and all these things. That wasn't done in a computer, that was done with really simple, basic, you know, foam core and a glue gun and some razor blade cuts. Next. Um, and I'm gonna skip over this because Margie already really laid it uh, very good. So uh, just the point that that big map, that 2040 plan, that template that we're all now trying to work on next is leading us to um, the corridors and centers um, in now in, in, in real time. So when you look at the diagram of the transit system of the light rail transit system, and you overlay that on the on the 2040 map, you know, that's where these things register directly. Um, we don't pick the transit corridor all the time because of the path of least resistance. Um, what we're trying to do is make it that trip where it begins and how it ends, it's about proximity. One thing I like to um, tell people when they come from other places, they go, God, everything moves so slow here. I go, yes, but you only have to move that far. <laughs> <laughs> and the other term I like to, to uh, make them aware of, I have, you, you have these things called suitcases. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's called luggage, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the word is lug. So um, when I'm in New York City, I have to lug my bag down into the subway. I have to go across here. And then I got to lug it back up to the top. One of the um, happy accidents, because we didn't have all these resources, is that we're operating thing in a horizontal plane. That is really difficult. That is madness. You, you separate the animals in zoos. You don't put the tigers in with the giraffe and the elephant. And all. But in our, we don't have all that space. We have to put everybody together. And we force this kind of civic discussion. We force this kind of civic behavior. And I love the question we were talking about just as early. It starts and what about lighting and how do I navigate? because I don't have any other option. I've got to figure out how to, how to do this safely. And it's why it's really uh, a very
great battle that we're waging, and, it, and we will figure it out. But one of the things that comes about through this process is this, like over and over and over again. By doing this sort of self-awareness and this very, you know, sausage making, I mean, the engineering is easy, sorry. It is actually really easy. I feel like engineering is actually easier than a community engagement. I've done both. Yes. <laughs> it's true. The human infrastructure is the thing that's true. really, really uh, the challenge. But we have found here that we behave best and our outcomes are better when we acknowledge that I need something and you need something. But if we make this agreement that we're both going to do towards the middle and uh, come up with a shared outcome, we're going to hold each other accountable for that. Because if I fail you, then you're screwed. And if you don't come through for me, then I don't get anything. So it, we constantly see, again, these opportunities um, uh, to do this continual relationship. And we see that there is not this dichotomy between the private sector and the public sector as a zero-sum game. It's actually trying to get these things together and figure out how um, again, the outcome is much bigger. Next. Just a little bit about the system. I'm going to fly through this stuff. It's more of the, the wanting materials that Ellen wants to share. We got bus lines. Yeah, we do. We got ridership. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> we got match lines. We got other ridership members. So um, also to say that Margie kind of laid it out. Um, <laughs> we got to get more of these things in order to deliver because there's more people that um, I think we created this, this sense of, of nirvana that they want to move to. Next. Um, and um, because we can't pull off everything by ourselves, we've also found that when we work in these partnerships, um, right, we're actually just sort of mutually reinforcing our best behavior. It's one of the streetcars or is a, owned by the city of Portland. It's for the city of Portland. It was created to, you know, work with development, um, um, not just in the pro district, but other places too. But TriMed, through a contract with the city, provides the operators and does the maintenance. That's something that we know how to do really, really well. But the city, they, they, you know, they kind of just you know, snow plow. So, so <laughs> let's acknowledge our weakness and let's acknowledge that we have some strength and then figure out what can we do together to um, leverage those. And I tell this story to folks around the country and they just can't believe that. No, no, no. They're going to silence. Only do it this way. Well, that's because you have a lot of money. We don't have a lot of money. We've got to figure out a share. Next. Uh, so this is a wrangle that Margie showed you sort of the first slide that happened the development over here and eventually figured out that the development could actually happen coincident with the platform at the station. But that took about a 15 year cycle to sort of work through. Um, this may be the big reveal folks. We don't have it figured out. This is, there's no, there's no other model you can go and look at and say, well, they did it like that. We're going to do it. No, no, no. We're making this shit up. <laughs> you know that you're recorded. <laughs> <laughs> this is a laboratory, and we're all working in the lab together. We're all walking around with white coats and, and fuzzy slippers and pajamas. We're working. <laughs> but when we do that, we're, we're leveraging that the smaller bit of land that we begin to have this aggregation density starts to reveal that it, it starts to play out that, that there's this multiplier effect that's happening you know and the market was figuring itself out this is uh, it was started during the recession and it started to move into like right out of the recession because hillsborough had already been thinking about some of these things and we had land bank a big park and ride uh, a daycare center for cars which really wasn't being used all that much. So the daycare for cars got taken away and now it is um, the Rainbow Station the parking lot. Yeah. So as we've already talked about the uh, regional transportation plan, um, again, this sort of overall arching thing is how do we find ways to make this stuff work? And one of the big, um, I think, leaps that we're figuring out is with new technologies and waiting to understand the data of how things are actually moving to the space and who is it affecting and how is it affecting and what time of day. And this is going to become, I think, our, our, our big data crunch because we're going to have to marshal that information to figure out how this all plays out. Next. Um, I had to have my, my graph um, to yeah. demonstrate that what she, what she said earlier was really true. And 
that, and it plays out the connected neighborhoods. Um, it doesn't all, you, you all have to jump on a time at bus or, or light rail or streetcar. We've now figured out that there's a lot more tools, the Swiss Army knife of, of mobility. And um, sometimes it's really scary, especially dark at night, you got your e scooter running around with the. Sorry, what's the purple? Mm -hmm. So the purple is, sorry, thank you, drive with riders. So in the suburbs, you're driving alone, 45%. Here we have somebody with us. Um, you can make up your own scenario who that might be. But transit, <laughs> right? One percent and walking on the other half of the block versus what we're seeing and what we're trying to get to in terms of connectivity, so that you have the choices, you can use the tool depending upon what the situation is. Um, one of the great reveals um, happened uh, for me uh, back in 2004. We we heard that real time information, not schedules or drive, but when is it actually going to get here? Don't tell me it's going to be here at 2:35. I want to know in two minutes, three minutes, four seconds. So count that. We're going to put all these um, displays all over the region, millions of dollars. As a project manager, I don't know how to do this stuff. That's IT. Uh, why was I doing this? But we got this um, ping uh, from this company down in the Bay Area, and they wanted to test this, these two things with us. Why? Because we have um, a Linux platform for all of our uh, transit data. Which means it's a shared platform. Means anybody can take this data. So this company said we want to create the thing called an app. What's that? Uh, it's going to go on a smartphone. All right, what's that? All we had was flip phones uh, in 2004, and the company was called Google, and they wanted to create this thing called Maps. So we were the first to share. Uh, careful what you do, but um, Google Maps using transit system for TriMet. I didn't have to put out displays. I just had to put a few in the downtown area. I didn't have to put them everywhere because now you carry this thing in your hand and you can decide what with that information, what you're going to do. Um, very different you know, shift in, in thinking. Next. So now <laughs> the future and it's bright and it's wonderful and we'll have all these uh, rooms on our freeway. <laughs> <laughs> So the other thing we've learned is that everything is changing and it's going to continue to change next. But how soon is it going to get here? That's the question we're all asking ourselves. When is autonomous vehicles <laughs> really going to be bumping around in our real time space? Um, how do we focus on that? We talked about equity earlier in terms of uh, access to transit and, and the idea of the enhanced transit corridor, this, this recognition here in the Portland region that rather than separating out the modes, we're going to put them together. And we're going to do that in a way that it's going to be better for folks so that, that coming at it from a customer experience, treating transit riders as people who want to have a nice experience. Very, very different. Next. Um, my few slides about the analysis that we're doing in terms of um, where folks are living and um, where folks in, in, in uh, Prices of housing have increased. When you flip those things over and you go, okay, we're starting to fall down in these areas. Next. Which leads us to what Margie was, was offering up as the, the pitch, and now we're going to get it um, that we are aligning with our services that we're planning and delivering relative to where the um, poverty is, is, is moving, and, and you can see that. And we've embedded that in our uh, annual business plan. So these sort of, you know, very aspirational things are finally landing on very specific objectives or goals that we have to operationalize um, immediately. Next. And here's how it's beginning to look for us that we're going to have a frequent corridor, 15 minutes uh, service all across this area. Next. And we're going to focus again corridors and centers. Um, our first one to try a new model is the Division uh, Transit Project. Um, it has a federal funding, yay, um, but it only allows us to do a very limited thing with the project, not at all the scale that we're talking about in the Southwest Corridor and Highway. 
We think this is going to deliver both greater capacity within the existing right of way um, and speed up service because we're going to use now technology to move things through and um, traffic prioritization with the transit rider now being given that sort of customer experience via connection. Um, yesterday at Trimus board meeting, um, there's a lot of folks who are saying five is a start, but you've got to speed this thing up a lot faster and transition from diesel. We ordered all these diesel buses. We should have been ordering electric buses. Uh, so it's great that we're having this pressure from our community. We want more electric transportation. We don't want more diesel. Um, and we understand now air quality, we understand about uh, equity, we understand that um, this is about giving you know higher quality service to the folks who really deserve it and need it. Yeah. But wasn't the protest yesterday against TriMet going for diesel yes. at the board meeting? Yes. Were you there? Yes. I was there. I'll try to ask you my Twitter business card email later. Uh, I think so you've had two protests this week, one about the fair and safe. Yes. Being racist and or obnoxious. Thank you. <laughs> well, we're paying you, right? We're paying with our tax money. $500 million budget with TriMet. Doug Kelsey just got a raise up to 300000 I can ask you later. Do you, do you want to take over the presentation now? Sure. But I think the teacher might object, who we're also paying. Thank you. He bought it. How many? I, I, the only other question I can ask is how many TriMet board meetings have you been to yourself? Not that many. Five, ten. Could you please let Lou? me continue the class? Um, let's, let's I can ask you later. It's fine. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Uh, all the way out to Gresham, um, coming down King Division, and as Martin was showing you, you know, this is just a diagram, but the, the specific neighborhoods and uh, folks who were moving through, um, people that are kind of connected here, that uh, opportunity to sort of have that engagement through this project, again, was some, one of the things that was just part and parcel of it, something that had been observed and learned over time. Now is you know becoming more and more the standard of how we um, operate in the state. So we'll go over the telephone crossing and then loop on to the Pacific Avenue. Um, ground is breaking now. Early utility work has begun, and um, this is scheduled to be complete by 23, 2023. Next, again, how the process um, you're going to see in the next slide. Next, uh, Martin's earlier picture. Oh wow. <laughs> James sent a shawl big landscape architect and former with feedback was like, I'm, I hate this picture. Like, everybody's seeing the new picture. Wow. Is that stuff? Well, we work together so that's much. We yeah, share, yeah. We share yeah. our so photos. These, these are actual folks that are actual meetings. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this, really a, this is not just picked off from the, from the web. This is from the business. Yeah. 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 So this is actually some of the design images of trying to figure out how a uh, platform is provided that operates more like a light rail vehicle in terms of its, its low floor boarding, which really speeds up the process without compromising what's happening uh, on the streetscape. So this is this is the you know the ecosystem we're trying to support with the transit system, but doing it in a way where um, again safety and um, Protection, other protection is being provided um, in uh, the illumination. This also was done in kind of building up those mock ups and testing and seeing with pe people moving through it across the bay in real time. Next. Um, two points to make, and then um, first one is that, that the Southwest Corridor, and Marty talked a little bit about the funding scheme that's uh, moving through that. But this is the most complex. Uh, 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 Area we've ever uh, attempted to go through, you know, and every dimension from geography to uh, topography, culture, history, um, all the things that it's connected to, politics, um, and the funding pressure that we are on to deliver it all the way to Bridgeport Village. Um, so, it's, but we're it, one of the lessons learned is that start earlier on this stuff and really begin to sort of churn through it. Um, a lot deeper and with a lot more, again, uh, engagement with folks talking about you know, what are those choices that we want to make and what's going to be in that final uh, package uh, going forward as the engineering construct 
because you've already done a lot of the human infrastructure stuff, right? So again, a lot of workshops on real time, you know, at, at the street level, not everything is done uh, on a computer uh, and a drawing, next. Um, and so the series of interventions and discussions have been happening <coughs> all the way through in each neighborhood, in each community, a much more sort of fine grained discussion again, very early on in the process. And again, just recognizing all the points of connection that are happening, both in terms of large institutions from OHSU to CCC Sylvania, um, also the connectivity of um, the bike system and also doing uh, restoration of natural habitat. So, you know, as a project, and the question was asked earlier, this is one that, again, the complexity of it, but the things that it's trying to do is stitching together um, the neighborhood and the community and using the, the transit system and that 50% so forth federal map um, is the overarching idea. Uh, next. And then my last point, again, is as we're doing these things, we're finding that the sort of participation, both of the city in terms of the uh, Smart Cities Initiative, next, are creating these new pathways for, again, folks to participate in this laboratory. Again, bringing their different uh, assets and skill levels, finding, again, new, new ways to, to look at these problems look for new solutions. Next. But you know, when we look into that crystal ball, um, it's pretty foggy. And there's, you know, there's, there's so much kind of coming up and changing. You know, we're asking ourselves, you know, how much of the current paradigm should we be paying attention to and planning for? Isn't there going to be more disruptive technologies and other things kind of coming up uh, sooner than you know than we think? And next. And they may be in ways that are not yet understood and having impacts on all sorts of other things that uh, currently now um, uh, exist, but maybe in 2030, maybe, might be a vastly different world. And uh, thank you. Talk a little bit about uh, the process that TriMet's thinking through with respect to electric buses. Mm -hmm. Just curious about what that. Um, a couple points. Um, we have a very hilly terrain, um, and electric buses really like flat land. Uh, they, you know, makes sense. We also have as a as a bus vehicle, it's got to move through and do all these things. So. Rather than filling up with you know diesel, how does the state charge through this whole route? Um, we want to fail quickly and understand what's happening. So we've created the loop between a Washington Square and Sunset Transit Center. And that's our kind of our beta test of what's happening with these buses. Um, just getting the vehicle delivered, um, and they have to be made domestically, uh, is a huge challenge. So one of the things is getting technology that's robust enough that actually works so that we can test it, so that we can see, well, is there something different about, you know, the electronics of the bus? What we have been seeing in the beta test already is a couple things. <coughs> um, customers really like it. It's a lot quieter. Um, drivers really like it. It's just a lot smoother. So both of these things are kind of aligning very well. Um, we put a sense of transit center, or center, center the quick charging apparatus there, we're seeing how that works. Um, before all, you know, we go forward all this stuff, we got to understand what's it going to mean to, you know, the people that work in our, in our system, our mechanics, where are we going to put all that stuff? We are planning on um, a new fourth base for buses, um, I want to say out in Columbia Boulevard, and we're already planning in that, how that could have more bus charging happen when the fleet starts to arrive. Um, we're also looking at a conversion uh, strategy of taking diesel, and it's not just making them completely electric, you know, making more of a hybrid diesel and electric. And that would ramp up the delivery of, of electric vehicles faster. Having read, rode the uh, 62 bus this morning for a couple of hours from Sunset to Washington mm -hmm. Square, um, I'm curious in terms of our equity focus for this class, why was that chosen as a West Side location. Great question. 
locally. Um, you know, it was chosen because we, we you know, it's kind of functional things rather than anything else about, you know, what was the neighborhood that it was working in. Uh, we had Merlot as the uh, base for Buck Ruby to store them there rather than uh, Ruby Junction and Center Street and Powell, which is going over a massive new building, redo. It had the topography challenges that we wanted to see. It was going to go up and down. It had the uh, dimension of distance that we wanted to test. So really it was just, that was, those are the key factors. It wasn't necessarily about, well, you know, this is what we want to serve Washington Square and, and Central Transit Center. Um, but that is kind of the, the test track that we're using. Yeah. Yeah, uh, do climate, they like purchase the land use when they develop, for example, like on the new purple line, on the like, is, is it still purple on that? I don't think that decision has been made yet. Oh, okay. Well, I'm, I, I, I didn't know. Sorry, Dan. Why goes to his shirt? I didn't say anything. You take your shirt. With the new nice line, so right. do Trimet own or buy the land use from the certain city? So. We work together on this. Yeah. Or do like Metro and stuff do this? Yeah, well, Prime Med and Metro coordinate very closely, but we have a longstanding tran transit-oriented development pod program. We have a land purchasing program as part of that. Probably one of our most well-known recent purchases that we're very proud of is purchasing the old furniture store on 82nd. There's orchards. It's now the Pano headquarters, and it has low-income housing. That was a pod project land we bought. Um, with the housing measure, we also asked the voters to approve 10% of it for land land purchases for affordable housing, but one of the criteria that you see on the transit line. Uh, but we coordinate heavily on these issues and I hear you're, you're hiring a new pod person as well, mm -hmm. coordinate with us. So we're, um, Metro and TriMet work together a lot as a team. So do that same protocol happens with like ODOT? No. Like, so like when certain no. um, um, that ODOT owns is right by a certain transit center, do like? No, and that um, some of the history and some of those conversations happening now, frankly, there's some history that if it's an ODOT owned roadway, so this is the history of interstate, mm -hmm. again, probably know it better than I do, that oftentimes ODOT will want to transfer that roadway to the local jurisdiction before the light rail is built on or near it. So they kind of want to step out of those community discussions. So that's what's being talked about the Southwest Corridor. Mm -hmm. There's a MO, no, there's an IDA or an MOU on Barber, an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding to transfer Barber to the city of Portland, the Southwest Corridor happened. Mm -hmm. And now the same conversation is happening in 82nd. Appreciate it. Uh, I can't bring Art up here because he needs to shoot. Yeah. Uh, prime or Metro like looked at environmental impact or ridership numbers of making Trimet free. Mm. Oh, yeah, um, Fairless uh, Square though. Yeah. Fairless Square. Yeah, I'm I'm the whole thing here, but it's right. Um, yeah, we have looked at that. Um, and we can't sustain that same financial model to do with that. That's a lot. Right now, we get about 30% of our First revenue our operating our school. School from fare, from fare box. And then the vast majority of it comes from, again, the fee that goes across the region uh, for something. We did have Fairless Square um, back starting in, I guess, the 80s on the, on the Tantrum Mall. And then when it went away um, about 2007 during the mall construction. Uh, so. That hasn't come back. And the purpose of Fairless Square is to protect clean air, and you got rid of it? That's, that's a question. No, that's, oh, great. That's, that's good time for a break. Well, for those that's of us who uh, personally turned in 1,400 signatures on that particular Please issue, stop.
since uh, 2000, no, 98. So I started as an intern while at PSU, so then I took the PSU transition class for two years, and then I um, worked uh, as a real employee since 2000. Uh, so uh, I'm at the 21 year mark.
um, the key question that I'm sure Irene talked a lot about this uh, is um, these two questions we asked next slide. Um, how will something we want to do that we're thinking is a good solution, will it advance equity and address structural racism? I like that. Uh, will it reduce carbon emissions? So really answering our, asking ourselves two really hard questions um, as we're talking about things that are um, either already planned or new and new initiatives that we're looking at taking on. City, like most cities in the U.S. Um, and even many cities globally, had a plan for a vast network of neighborhoods. A vast network of neighborhoods, and the ones in black are the ones that were uh, actually constructed um, or existing, and the rest are the expansive replacement of existing cities. Um, so there was, you know, it, and I still don't quite understand how this came to the 1990s. Yeah, but uh, wow. it says it right there. So I don't know how to like. Refuted, but so I think we thought about the change happening much earlier, but I think some of this change is still pretty deep. Doesn't, it, doesn't that show the Montel Freeway though where uh, this is Powell here? I think this is the extension of Powell. Maybe? I don't know if this was an older projection of what oh maybe so. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. right. But uh, the main you know, the main premise of this is there was a path that we thought we were heading towards that we would be living in now. That most of these would be complete now. Um, and uh, next slide. Uh, you know, when you think about the world that we would be existing in, if that had been the path that we followed through on, might look a lot like this. You know, portions of our area still does, right? This is Lloyd Center area, and much of it still has this much uh, parking. But when you think about the, the effects of relying on automobility, it is not just about the roads, it's about the landscape and the effects on land. This, for instance, is an illustration of the amount of parking needed to, uh, uh, to absorb the growth that we were projecting for downtown if we didn't have light rail systems. So you just think about it, it's not just the light rail system. We could have downtown that's all parking garages and still be complaining about the traffic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 19, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 1970s. Uh, we had 180 days of air quality uh, violations. 180 days, half the year. It felt like you know, gone. picture that gorge fire that we that we yeah. all endured and said, "Oh my God, this is terrible." That's what it felt like to be in Portland, um, and so that's I mean that's significant and it's significant as a cautionary tale in terms of uh, our motivations for this kind of thing. I won't go into a lot of details, but we all have the same slide. Yeah, um, <laughs> our, all of our work is based <laughs> on the same <laughs> prospect and concept, and that's actually super important because it creates one we created a common vision for what we're we trying to do. Two, we, we amplify <coughs> our understanding of how valuable our streets and lands within the urban growth boundary are that force you to make better decisions. You don't really have so much to talk about, but let's let's really talk, make really smart choices. That allows us to align the land use and transportation together to try to produce the most efficient outcome. Uh, Portland was the first city in the United States in 1993 to adopt a carbon emissions standard. So this is not a new idea for. For Portland, it's a maybe newer idea for the broader uh, political consciousness. But Portland has been um, attending to this issue for many, many years. Um, transportation actually is now 42 percent. The slide is, is uh, dated um, in terms of contribution towards um, uh, climate uh, impacts. So transportation is crucial to our future of, of explaining the climate change. Yeah. Is that because? It has actually gone up, or yes. is it because other parts have gone down? Uh, both. Uh, uh, yeah, good, good question. As I understand it, uh, some of the building impacts have gone down to better efficiencies. And yes, transportation has gone up uh, in terms of uh, total trips. <coughs> now, you know, as, as we grow, there's more people driving um, uh, in both ways. Yeah, yeah. But no, I think that's, that's a key part of it. Yeah. Just want to show you that there was an article released by Timothy. Had it done by Harvard and it's really super easy to how 
overall in the country the emission from people driving a low income went up in the recent years but overall despite all of the efforts we've been doing towards you know like eliminating that it's been, it's been going up so we don't um and so it's uh particularly when we're looking at moving people and goods class is still on the thing they're about this issue clearly um is probably the most daunting uh, of our tasks uh, as a society when you look at our actual trajectory in terms of carbon emissions um so when you and you look at what we have been projecting that we need to do which is in the gray which is getting to uh 80 percent reduction by 2050 and now we're moving as a city to saying we're going to be getting to net zero by 2050. That's a really steep culture change. If we are uh, all here together, right? Um, so we're, we're it, you know, we consider it to be exciting times or really scary times, but this is the moment when we need to uh, act really quickly, act decisively, um, and it's not going to be easy. Yeah. Uh, the first plan was in 93. Yep. And nothing happened. Is it, was there just nothing in the plan about carbon emissions? No, no, I think it's all been, uh, I think it's, it's, it's just it's demonstrating how hard it is to um, turn back the, the tide. That as, as cities are, you know, as we're growing, buildings are getting more efficient, but they're still getting more buildings. Cars are getting more efficient, but they're still getting more cars. So each of these elements, we're doing much better. Like there's not a, I didn't grab the slide, but there's a slide showing Baltimore County versus the rest of the U.S. Like the kitchens are fine, the natural, but doesn't mean that we're actually going to have that. That would lead one, I guess, to be skeptical about the tree part. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is really, I mean, I have, uh, I've had a tough week, so I won't even get into the details, but, um, you know, this is part of my tough week, is to be feeling, man, this is such a hard work for me, and it's going to take things that we hadn't thought possible. Yeah, it's a big deal. I'm really glad you're here. Why was your week tough? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the transportation Yeah, he's a teacher. Well, like, talk about your week. Okay, all right. Um, uh, Remember, you're on air. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll sort of generalize it. Um, it is really hard when you're with an agency. To, um, you know, it seems, I, and I think you know, truly, I am in a place of influence um, and have a lot of power um, over the things that we're doing, but I'm also trying to function within a vast organization structure. We have multiple agencies, uh, you know, leadership hierarchies. It's just very hard to make progress in that <coughs> setting and, 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 and make progress and stick with the progress versus thinking you've made a front and then find things sliding back and having to, you know, get up that next morning try again. So that's really what I think I can take. That's been my week. It's sort of thinking we were farther along than we were and sliding backwards and going, all right, try again. You know, go for a run in the woods, yell at Playa Ocha Street. That's sort of my, my release area. I get to yell at the ferns. But that's the reality of the work, right? But yeah. It is the reality of the work. It's so. the reality of the work. I mean, this is, yeah, the, you know, this, the, I, I know the community advocacy feels really hard to work within the agency. It's incredibly difficult. And it's hard in every infrastructure once you transportation. Yeah, no, I think this is just, yeah. you know, as a as a culture of changes, it's just impossible to find. Yeah, so I guess the, the piece of context that I didn't get into, um, our group within the Bureau is called Policy, Planning, and Budget. It's made up of three divisions, the long-range planning um, and project planning team, the capital project delivery uh, department, so overseeing the physical change in the, in, within the city, all the city <laughs> projects, and then active transportation and safety, which is really seeing the people-based, the behavior change type of activity, the program delivery, uh, Save Routes to School, Division Zero program, um, uh, all those kind of elements are run within that group. Sunday Parkway, the bike share program, that's just all one uh, department. Um, but so we're, we are, I see us as the change management office within the Bureau, trying to figure out how quickly we can push physical change and actual change to try to uh, attend to that. Um, an analogy that I've come to really like that I think uh, is, fits within this construct still is when we're thinking about um, transportation systems, um, there's, a, there's an analogy that we're thinking about energy efficiency and thinking about how we are reducing our impact in terms of energy consumption um, to avoid needing to build more power plants. 
as similar to avoiding our impact on the system to avoid needing to build more freeways and more roads and more bikes. Um, and so our transportation hierarchy for people movement is really focused in on um, supporting and, and prioritizing those modes that can be the most efficiently consume transportation resources where people can, um, can provide their own transportation rather than uh, needing institutional organizational resources and uh, the power of fuel and electricity to do that. So that's really the, the driver of us focusing on walking for trips one mile or less, cycling for trips three miles or less, transit for those trips that cannot be met through walking and cycling. Uh, this is obviously a very wonky slide. This is uh, we're seeing fleets of autonomous vehicles as maybe the next in the in the in the pile before we get down to other shared and uh, low occupancy vehicles. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> so when we're thinking about uh, how we are going to reduce the impact on the transportation system, uh, one way we've been talking about is closing the trip gap, which is in 2010, 2035. If we are not changing how we are um, traveling throughout the system, we are going to see about 500,000 additional cars on the road every year in Portland. Um, and obviously, we're here now, so how far from status quo have we achieved is a, is a fair question. Um, but very focused in on using more efficient use of the, the right of way through transit, walking, and cycling. Next. Uh, Vision Zero, uh, which was uh, really Margie's initiative that she brought to the Portland Vision. Is that a joke? Wiggly tree. Yeah, well, Wiggly <laughs> tree, yes. But Margie, Margie carried it. Leah, yeah, Leah pointed hard to get it. <laughs> right, Leah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it is a crucial part of this conversation: is making sure that um, the moves that we are making um, are focused on our vulnerable populations and the impact of um, on fatalities, which are going to be awful big. The health agency is talking about that this year at 44 fatalities per year, which is where we were. Um, and I think it, it really highlights when we're thinking about equity, you know, the places that we are seeing the, the, the brunt of this issue is places that are um, now where our economic people of color, seniors, people of low income proficiency are living. Um, so this is, a, this is a really big uh, thing. Uh, so our goal is um, to get to uh, you know, go from 57% drive alone to 30% drive alone by 2025. Keep going because I know I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tighten back up our time here. Um, so this is, I, I, if I had, was just going to show you one slide, like what is Portland's plan? I think this would probably be the slide. Mm -hmm. um, so we're focused on key places, making sure that, that, the, that we're able to uh, create these key places that are where you can live close to the needs that you would have as a daily, um, uh, on your daily uh, so shopping, groceries, school, those elements. If you can live close to those areas, you don't need a vast transportation system to make those connections happen. So that's the goal behind these centers. Um, and in terms of investments, we're really focused in for walking on fixing gaps and improving safety and comfort along those streets. We're asking the same streets that were here in the 1920s and 30s to be so much more. Um, and so we need to put in additional crossings, additional lights, and, you know, all of these things to retrofit the system. For cycling, uh, we need it to be just as possible for my 13-year-old, as it is for me, to traverse this city um, and, and traverse it comfortably, and we are not there yet. And we're, and we're not going to get there without really substantial change to our expectations of our kids' streets. Uh, for transit, it is continued to be crucial to our growth strategy to expand the rail network. We will not be able to um, support the, dens the density that we are projecting for these areas without a continued uh, support for the rail network. And then moving towards bus speed and reliability, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second. Um, and you know, all of these actions, again, are washed over looking at where are the areas of, of um, greatest emphasis for equity. We see the orange highlight of these centers. These are the centers that have uh, the greatest efficiency and also have Greatest efficiency are projected to absorb additional growth, but also are the areas with uh, the highest uh, people of color, low income, and English, really English proficiency. So those are areas where we're focusing our investments, um, and particularly uh, to do that work. All of this, I, I see uh, the Portland area. You know, we are we're saving space for others really right now, 
because we are we are saving space for the trips that cannot um, happen um, through walking, cycling, and transit that need to happen by motor vehicle, and also saving space for, for freight because we do want our bike parts to be able to be by train. Uh, next. Um, so here's a, a screenshot of the little scoring of our road project when we were looking at streets that we might do investments on for various types of change of uh, crossings and cycling and changes. And so as you see, here's the equity score from zero to three. So we hear the top score was those in red. So we obviously you can see that the East Portland area is directly um, overlapped with our equity index as we were looking at prioritizing the project. Really focused our capital improvement program on the equity score. Okay. Uh, here's sort of a hypothetical example of what a street such as Outer Gleason that you might have been reading about uh, a lot of upset people in the last <laughs> months. Um, that's next. You know, this is the uh, the type of change that we saw on that street, and this is the type of change that we are envisioning and needing to see on a lot of these wide range of streets in East Portland. Uh, very, very hard for the metro to do this, and I think a lot of people are going to be there. Um, we just can't believe that we would think that a street could look like this and the way that this is laid out and the way that it is right there. Um, it's very hard to daylight how dangerous streets are and how can we clean them up so quickly. Um, one of the changes we've done recently, and you might have noticed those variable message boards. Um, we now put a variable message board with a fatality for a couple of weeks, and if a fatality happens here on this date, we can travel and share. It's part of an awareness campaign because there could have been a fatality at that intersection. There could have been multiple fatalities at that intersection. <coughs> and if it's cleaned up within a couple hours, no one has a lasting understanding of the impact that their travel is having on the street. Um, Yeah, lots of good photos. I think we share these. I think we share these uh, uh, slides back. Yeah, yeah. So I want to stop here for a second. Okay. So one of the really big uh, changes that I helped lead over the last three, four years was this realization that um, we were seeing decline and continuous decline in bus uh, ridership in recent years. Um, and this realization that as much as we can blame climate for that and try to blame climate for that, it's actually us that did this to us. All of us did this to us by not understanding that allowing bus to be caught in some shared traffic is creating a failed situation for them. They're in congestion. Um, they're not going to be able to outcompete because they're on the sitting on the bus, sitting in traffic. This doesn't feel like a failed situation. Um, so we pushed very hard for Portland. I actually presented the first transit corridor presentation at the regional uh, table about four or five years ago. It was sort of an odd thing to have, oh, here comes Portland talking about buses. But this is, you know, we had to really push this conversation into consciousness at the regional meeting. And it's now part of the regional transit plan. It's part of the regional transportation plan. Uh, we've even got great tweets recently from Trimet uh, talking about uh, buses are, what is it, bus lanes are red. They, they, they hope you like them too. I can't remember what oh, it's very right. cute. Roses right? are red. Roses are red. red. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, buses Our bus are lanes red. will be too. Yeah. yeah. But I think this is an interesting conversation when we think about sort of, uh, you know, how to attribute things that are happening uh, within our city that we don't like. The cause isn't always, or the sort of the, 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 isn't always what we necessarily think. So for us, Portland is taking on very, very aggressive discussions of uh, reallocating roadway space to prioritize transit. We've seen those already on some of the bus lanes downtown that we saw the city in motion. We're now developing a plan at the commissioner's direction called the Rose Lane uh, Project that is looking at expanding that network substantially out into the rest of the city, um, which will be important segment of the city. Okay, next. We'll keep going. Sorry, give you your time back. All right, somebody wants to go back. Oh, you want to go back? <laughs> you can go back. <laughs> you have a question? Anyone have a question? Yeah, we would use it. Does anyone have a question about this picture? You're not the red, you're not the road lanes going in. That, um, I read that they were. Why does the go in? Oh, oh cool. If, uh, um, so, yeah, right now, uh, so that was the very first one that's slated for change is uh, you're coming off the of road. You're coming into the town. It's going to be worse than that. Um, okay. One of the interesting things about road lanes, sorry to take a little while to write. Okay. It's okay. We, I'm going to try to be done. No, we don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so, this, and so we were already tracking the, uh, the level to which drivers were observing that new uh, transit um, box there. And now, so now we're ready to change the uh, Here's the observation. Um, so, uh, it's a great Seeing a lot more of this, we just want a new machine that's been able to take on the um, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. Um, keep going. Keep, oh, 
so I'll pause for just a moment. You know, I, it's really, really important to forget that, to not forget that we're doing this for people in the end, right? We're doing this for us. And unless we help people understand that their city they may have lived in for 20, 30 years may be changing, they're gonna, it's gonna take them some time to adjust. It may take their kid telling them, hey, the city's different than this too. Um, we, it takes programs, it takes effort to go out and shake somebody out of their shell and out of their daily routine to realize that there's now a bike lane on that street that is between the, you know, there's maybe a whole network of bike lanes between home and work. It means you don't even have to go on a busy street the whole way. I didn't know that, right? Oh, that's great. You know, that kind of work, that takes direct people-based work. That's very helpful. Chris Dowell's in here doing this. Um, yeah, so next. Who is the Sunny Parkway Center? Yeah. Right. Like the red, I don't know. Yeah. That's what I meant. <laughs> so Sunday Parkway is yeah. a great example. Sunday Parkway is, is intentionally bringing you on our neighborhood greenways and connecting with green parks, so families, people can realize, oh, that wasn't so bad. I actually, I biked five miles today without even realizing with my five-year-old. Oh my gosh! Like this, you know, it's, it's opening up your mental frame of possibilities. Um, the Smart Church program, and then I'll leave us there. Perhaps um, is. Uh, crucial to that process, that intervention, which is letting people know that uh, change has come to their city and they need to be part of that change. Um, so I think I better stop. What, what are you, so trend lines, so trend lines, sorry. So trend lines, um, it, it, when you look at it this way, we're making progress, right? Uh, driving has decreased over the last 15 years from 65% down to 57%. The primary, um, uh, new entrants have been working from home and cycling, but if you go next slide, things feel a little uh, unreal right now, right, in terms of traffic. But if you keep going, there's a couple of causes that at least I would like to look at. Um, when you look at what has grown the most, and most in terms of real numbers over the last 15 years, black, you drive alone. So what's happening in our region right now, you'll see cycling, walking, working from home as the primary growth happening within these core inner areas of Portland and driving being the core main change happening in the suburbs around the town. Shouldn't all the other side of Columbia be in black then? Uh, <laughs> probably wasn't in our data set, but you absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so next slide. But then the other part why my week was really bad is I got this new chart Monday. It looks terrible. I apologize that we haven't had anyone time to clean it up. It looks like a real chart. Though. But it's a real chart. This is actually a real one. This is like the raw data. This is last year. That's driving last year. We, we just added 10,000 new drivers every day this last year. And so if you think about that climate slide, almost green, that green, you know, downward step, things are heading in the wrong direction. And we found this out this week. So I'm, I'm depressed this week because I feel like we can do so much more. Yeah. So it's hard to interpret it because it says 10,000 new drivers every single day. Every no. single year. So oh, 2017 year? to 20 years. <laughs> yeah, 2017. But every, but every day. But every day there's 10,000 new people, not again and again each year or each day. But between 2017 to 2018, an average, an average of 10,000 more people. Oh, you know. But so that's, you know, if, if things feel crowded, you know, this is why. So one next, next slide and I'm totally out. Um, this is uh, sort of where things are heading for us uh, in terms of effort, the Rose Lane projects, pricing for equitable mobility. There's a, a pretty amazing new conversation that we're sparking. We have 170 applicants to be part of the advisory <coughs> committee to talk about how pricing can be in service to creating more equitable outcomes. I see it as the crucial, crucial move over our next five years um, because it's not going to change behavior enough without using pricing signals. And we're not using pricing to do good for the things that we want to do. Uh, so, all right, I'm out. Uh, we'll have to join this committee. So for pricing, uh, the parking pricing that you may or may not So parking pricing, the, the uh, fees that you're charged for your trip on an Uber and Lyft, all those things are part of the choice that you make. Uh, you have to do a lot of things with the future of the platform.
more cycling than the or cycling for the um, But it, it, it's a huge dilemma. I, uh, the city is crushed. I personally have been crushed, so I'm yeah. going to play music right after this. My weekly routine is bike out to go play music and then take the car and go home from the cellar because it's like 11 o'clock at night and I want to bike seven miles. So I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, it, it, it's, it's a really, it's not good. Like, car to go is a key part of our system for my system. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that I tell my family. Hey, you can go to Christmas. You can just you know, rent a car. Yeah, just for the one or two trips. You can, you, yeah. Oh, you can't. Yeah, so, uh, so, so there's, 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 I think I think there's I, I think there's going to be someone coming back in, but I haven't heard, heard who that is. But I totally agree. Who owns the world's Coming to the Central City School Board, especially whether we can make it to the high school team for that, or whether we can play in the city. 